Hello and welcome to the In Publishing podcast, bringing you weekly insights into the newspaper and magazine publishing sector. I'm Keir Byrne, and this week my guest is Matt Kelly, Chief Content Officer at Archant. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Acorn Web Offset, the Yorkshire-based specialist A5 and A4 magazine printer. With high-speed web offset and sheet-fed printing, together with in-house saddle stitching, perfect binding and mailing services, Acorn can cope with the most demanding of production turnarounds. Acorn prides itself on its efficiency and low-cost print production. For more information, visit acornweb.co.uk. Matt Kelly is Chief Content Officer of Archant, the UK's fourth largest regional publisher, which was recently taken over by a private equity firm. He joined Archant from UK regional newspaper group Local World and has held senior editorial roles at the Daily Mirror. Matt, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Hi, Keir. Can we begin by talking about your journey from starting out as a cub reporter in Merseyside to where you are now? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I um, I left um, college with few qualifications and was rather aimless as a sort of late teenager. And because my parents had both been journalists, that was something that had been in my head. And I fixed myself up with a, a week's work experience at the Bootle Times um, and uh, just loved it. Loved it from day one. Loved the sense of adventure, the sense of anything being able to happen, loved the sense of being at the heart of a community, you know, uh, and, and almost having permission to, to nose about and to, and to make yourself um, relevant and busy, you know. Uh, so I took to journalism instantly and was very keen to get a, a staff job, which I eventually got uh, on the Formby Times, which was where I was living at the time. So that was perfect. It was a uh, really strong weekly paid for newspaper sadly doesn't exist anymore but um it was at the heart of the community i lived in the community so it was it wasn't really like a job it was just like reporting everything that was going on um uh, there were big moments there within the first couple of weeks of me starting hillsborough happened and there were three kids who lost their lives from formby in hillsborough so as a very very young reporter i found myself in the living room of people who had lost a child the day before. And right. you know, that was a very searing introduction to how important local journalism is because outside was the national press trying to get in and they weren't welcoming. In fact, some of the national press lied about being from the local paper, but being part of the, the Formby Times, uh, I think that was the first moment, although I was probably too young to fully recognize it, but it, made me realize that local press is is not just an objective spectator on on the community it's part of the community and you know we were very much welcomed into those homes because those people wanted to tell the story of what had happened to their their kids you know and and that was the hillsborough campaign was something that you know uh in fits and starts followed me around my whole career you know right through to the daily mirror which did some wonderful campaigning on behalf of hillsborough so i think it demonstrated very clearly that that a lot of very important things start locally and it's not always the other way around, you know. So anyway, after three years, I served my indentures there, as they used to be called, my sort of training uh, contract and never quite got my shorthand. So if you're a trainee journalist struggling with that uh, then there is hope for you if you can't get that 100 words a minute. So <laughs> um, I then got a job on uh, the Daily Post as a district reporter. And um, I was, without a shadow of a doubt, the world's worst district reporter. No um, uh, entrepreneurial motivation, no self-motivation at that age. Really needed an office environment. And in fact, Keith Ely, the editor of the Daily Post at the time, called me in and said, look, you know, you've got talent, but I'm not sure that journalism's your future, mate. And maybe you should think about something else. And so I left very disconsolate from that meeting. And it just so happened on the sister paper, the Liverpool Echo, there was a sub-editor's job going. And I applied for that and they saw in me something. And I got the job as a sub and never really looked back from there. Production journalism was 
was something that I just took to like a duck to water. I loved the the idea of writing headlines and laying out pages. I loved loved the creativity around designing pages, but also the sense of wanting to make an immediate impact with people. You know, so that yeah. you could put all of those elements together and 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 constitute something that would demand attention. You know, that was that was something really really I enjoyed. Um, so I had a very happy two or three years on the Echo. Uh, and then I got a job on the Daily Record in Glasgow, having spent months and months driving up and down the M6 to do shifts in London on various uh, tabloids and broadsheets, sort of driving, you know, all night and then paying 20 quid to stay in a real dive of a hotel and then doing a shift on the Independent one day and then the Independent on Sunday the next and then another shift on the Sunday for Monday and then driving back. And then arriving back at Liverpool Echo at dawn, almost, you know, to, to right. start the, the evening newspaper shift. So that was really hard work. But uh, again, it was kind of driven by a sense that, uh, you know, there was further to go. And I wanted to, I wanted to see if I was good enough to, to make it on the national newspapers. And I, I look back now and think that, that it was a slightly erroneous thought because it, they're very different things media uh, wise local and and national media and i don't think to compare them is entirely fair anyway there was certainly more money in national media at the time so that was one motivation and eventually i i did two or three years on the record and then i got a job on the daily mirror yeah. um just as piers morgan started so i had 10 years of piers morgan which was invigorating and fantastic and whatever people's view of him as a as a TV celebrity, I can tell you he was a fantastic tabloid editor. You know, he was exciting. There was no limits to anything in terms of getting us, getting the the biggest possible stories, you know, and going out and doing deals with people. And, and every, every day was a day that sort of demanded excitement. And I think sometimes you look at newspapers these days, and for a lot of kind of understandable reasons, some of that ability to to create that daily verve and, and excitement has, has dissipated a bit. So uh, I worked with Piers all the way through until Piers lost his job because of the Iraq uh, photo um, uh, debacle where um, the mirror printed some photos that were alleged to show uh, Iraqi prisoners being abused by, by British soldiers. And, and it was abuse that later turned out to have been absolutely true and had happened and there's been court martials since but the only problem was these photos were proven to be a hoax so that cost Piers his job um and of course no one's ever heard of him since which is a bit of a <laughs> weird thing but uh i so i then took charge of the features department at the mirror for a while and then i moved yeah. over to digital um and in about 1990 no 2004 2005 i think i took over the uh, website having designed the first mirror website as an, almost as a sort of side side uh, hobby and obviously this thing called the internet became more and more important and increasingly there was more and more attention on it so I spent a very happy six or seven years uh, working on the mirrors uh, portfolio of websites a new guy came in from AOL called Chris Ellis who's a very good friend of mine today but we didn't quite see eye to eye at the time and after about a year working with Chris, we'd both had enough and it was me that decided it was time to exit left. So I, I left the mirror in 2012 and joined a Spanish design agency based in Bar Barcelona called uh, Casas and Associates. Yeah. And uh, spent another wonderful two or three years working largely in Latin America, uh, mainly with Clarín, which is Argentina's uh, leading newspaper trying to effect the digital transformation. Um, and, and very successfully so, uh, I, I don't say that on behalf of myself, but I say it on behalf of Clarine, you know, they went from being quite a, an ordinary digital outfit to being quite a superb and, and the leading uh, Latin American voice now online. So that was great fun. And then we got pregnant, my wife and I, uh, and I had to come back home um, and joined, um, David Montgomery, who I'd worked with yeah. previously at The Mirror on Local World. And uh, then we sold that to Trinity Mirror, or Reach as it now is, and then got a job with um, Archant. There you go. That's the longest career <laughs> history 
in the in the world. <laughs> very, very beautifully delivered. Um, and how's your Spanish? Uh, terrible. Uh, <laughs> muy mal. Uh, hablo muy poquito de español because they all speak English so well and they right. want to practice right. their English. But yes. I, I can swear very effectively in Argentinian slang, but we won't go there. No, not 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 now. Um, <laughs> Just so, in case. So you're now at Archant, and yeah. um, earlier this month they were bought out by a private equity firm, Our Capital Partners. Was that a direct result of COVID nineteen? And can you tell us a bit more about what that means for your role and for the company in general? Um, well, what it means for me and the company in general, I hope is well. Certainly for the company, I hope is positive. Uh, although time will tell. Um, to answer your first question, it's yes, um, certainly the situation was brought on by the COVID crisis. Like everybody, we've been battered in terms of advertising revenue, although our advertising department under the direction of um, a quite brilliant commercial director called Lorna Willis has has massively overperformed our, our peers, to our knowledge, um, in terms of the recovery. But nevertheless, it still cost us millions and millions but the real issue that that was the acute problem the chronic problem has been of course the uh the pension paying off the fixed salary pension deficit every year and yeah there's an old saying about legacy newspaper companies really in truth being pension schemes run but you know serviced by publishing businesses and there's a lot of truth to that every year we had to pay several millions before we could even start accumulating any money that we needed to invest in, in what is still going to be a very long and difficult and expensive transformation, you know, to reinvent what Archant and its titles means. So that was really the backdrop. Um, and that's something that the company's been struggling with for a long time. Very, very, you know, wonderful to be an ex-employee on a fixed term, uh, fixed salary pension um, and massively deserved, but nevertheless, uh, something that the existing employees, um, it, it was a burden. Uh, now, this deal, still a little time to go through before it's fully ratified and all of this, but hopefully this this deal will liberate the business from that onus of having to pay those millions uh, each year and will give us the runway to to make the, the massive transformation that has been needed and has been needed for quite a long time. That's Archant. Uh, in these strange times which you've touched on, how do you think the world of regional newspapers is faring more generally? Um, I think it's in an awful lot of trouble. Um, I think we uh, have reached a point where years and years of opportunity to invest that was missed is now coming home to roost. And um, something... Um, important that um that must be translated from a local newspaper in print to a local website online is missing and we've got to try and work out what that element is so that the people we're selling our our newspapers to are also willing and understanding enough to want to buy our digital offering because what's becoming very clear is that the model around digital display advertising in other words try and harness as many clicks as you possibly can and really pay attention to where they're coming from secondary uh that model does not work that you're never going to make enough money on digital advertising to support the cost of a newsroom as they are today so we need to get to the point where people who who really have been you know we've been grooming these people for ever since the internet began to to believe that digital news is free uh, and that's a real problem when when it comes to funding what I think and I think, you know, most sane people would agree with with us is that local news is a very, very important constituent element of our social setup. And without it, it you wonder and fear for communities who, you know, could be um, hard done by or abused by by miscreants, the kind of people that we are on the case of and who keep councils on their toes and keep you know local institutions on their toes hopefully in a supportive way but take that away and you do end up with something that is no longer 
as cohesive as it was with a, a strong local media. So I think, I hope, and I think this is why our capital have bought into Archant and our strategy, because it has been and is founded around that principle that clicks are, are much relegated towards a sense of local engagement and relevance. You know, we, the audience we're chasing is, we describe it as large, loyal and local, and they're the only clicks I'm interested in. And what I'm interested in understanding is how do I go from having uh, a so-called loyal user being somebody who might click on our websites once or twice a week to somebody who clicks on them three or four times a day, you know, and, and what's missing to make that behavior the, the norm rather than exceptional, you know? So I think at Archin, I'm very lucky. We've got a very, very talented team of open-minded journalists who think very hard about these things with me. And we're trying to change what we do to make our digital experience much more part of people's lives rather than the sort of take it or leave it offering that that some other uh, websites have become. And I mean, you, you, you want more clicks, but how does that monetize in the end? And you've been quoted in the past as saying it's nigh on impossible to get readers to pay for local news. Do you still think that? And but, how do you see yeah. sub, the subs model evolving? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I, that quote, um, which has been used to soundly beat me around the head <laughs> by, by, by various former employees of Archant who uh, miraculously have discovered the answer to journalism just at the point of departure. It's, it's a shame they didn't think about it when, when they were there uh, enough. But anyway, the, the full quote was, it's, it's nigh on impossible to get people to pay for local news online in its current form. And right. That's that's the key to me. We, we've got to change the model. It's got to evolve into something that people want to engage with daily, hourly, you know, every, you know, three, four, five times a day. It becomes part of their life. And frankly, there's not enough news in Norwich to or Ipswich or H Highgate and Hampstead to to make it that compelling just to rely on on news. So you have to think. Well, what else are people really interested in and passionate about? And when you start thinking that way, you realize that news is a tiny proportion of, of what drives the content that drives a healthy community. You know, there's information around employment and about what's going on in society. There's opportunities for people to have a greater, more open dialogue about the things that are happening in their communities that newspapers traditionally don't allow. So, you know, traditionally newspapers have let people either write a letter to the editor or, or stick a comment on the bottom of a story online. I think we can go a lot further than that and we can be facilitators of a conversation between people in the community. We can literally bring them together as we've been doing, you know, in, in our Norwich and our Ipswich newsrooms and in London, we've been hosting um, what we call open house where we'll pick a topic and we'll write up notes for participants to, to read and digest before they come into the office. This has obviously all been, you know, interrupted by, by COVID-19, but yeah. come into the office and have a proper debate, a grown-up constructive debate about these important issues that previously we may just have been reporting on and expecting others to solve. Well, I think the role of local media has got to be about becoming part of that solution. Uh, being very constructive in our approach and being uh, open to all sorts of other views, not just saying that we're the only ones who can do journalism. You know, we're not. There's lots and lots of people have very passionate and very articulate viewpoints about things that matter to them in the community. And to say to them that the only avenue to you is to write a letter to the editor seems to me to, to put a wall up in front of people when actually what we should be doing is pushing down those walls and saying, how can we all come together and champion this community we all care about so much? Well, one of the things you um, have been doing is you've received funding from Google to explore new business models for local news. Can you tell us a bit more about that partnership and how that came about and what the aims are? So this is uh, a partnership we've called Project Neon. Um, and 
the aim is to see if there's a, a new way of of creating a model, a sustainable model for uh, digital local news. And obviously that's something that has been our obsession for a long time, although in most cases we've been thinking about how do we convert a print audience into a uh, digital audience. Well, in this instance, we're saying to ourselves, how can we create a new digital platform that people in a certain community love so much that they either visit it enormous numbers of times through the day, or they'll actually pay to be part of it and to, and to keep it going. And I think, you know, there's so many different components to it. There's, you know, what's the right advertising model? How do you talk meaningfully again to all those local independent businesses that traditionally would have relied on their local newspaper, but since Google and Facebook and others have come around, have had another avenue for their marketing spend. Well, how can you rethink what you do so it means something special to them to be on your site and not on Google or Facebook? There's the way we report the community, you know, just going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, can we do a better job about being visible on the street, about listening to the community, about what's, what's really bothering them, about not deciding that that we have a monopoly on what qualifies as good content, you know, accepting that people in the community are interested in things that traditionally journalists may have turned their noses up at. Well, I think the days of journalists turning up their noses at content that the community is passionate about are are well and truly over. I'll give you a quick example of this. We have a very, very successful and highly engaged audience on a platform we call Eyewitness. And it's essentially a amateur photographer's society, but it, it exists wherever there are archant titles. And it's very successful in Norfolk and in the Southwest and in other places to a lesser degree. But about 50% of the photographs that people send in are of sunsets, right? Now, right. If, you put, if you put a photo of a sunset in front of a newspaper picture editor, they'll go, oh, my God, you've seen one, you've seen them all, you know, show me something interesting. But I think you've got to take a step back and say, well, if people are really enamored with taking photographs of beautiful sunsets, if we sneer at them, then we are saying to them, you're different. We don't understand you completely. What we should be doing is embracing it and showing them how to take better sunset photographs and celebrating the best sunset photos and just bringing people in that way through the open door of something they're passionate about will open up many other avenues that we can engage with them and reach them with good content. And that's what I'm talking about when I mean we've got to rethink from the ground up what content it is we are expecting our communities to love us for. Because the only thing I can tell you for absolute certain is the content we're giving them now in its entirety is not doing the job. So we can either be arrogant and stand back and say, it's the audience's fault. They don't like our journalism. They should know better. Or we can say, do you know what? We've got to open our ears a little bit more and listen to what they are genuinely interested in and see if we can play a valuable role in, in making that passion more accessible and fruitful and enjoyable for them. But do you think that's something they're really going to pay for? I mean, for example, with sunset photographs, you could get that on a local Facebook group. Um, I know that our local Facebook group does something very similar and they can get that for free. So how do you get people to pay for that yeah. content? So very, very good and apposite question. Um, I mean, take the amateur photography. Let's stick with that theme. Now, we've got photographers and picture editors and we've got page designers and they are all expert in one way or another about how to compose or or publish a great photograph and you've got a whole bunch of people out there who are passionate about photography and spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds on equipment and go out whenever they can to take photographs of sunsets or birds or the sea or or whatever it may be now i don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that those people would like to come together and talk to our people about how to improve what they do, 
I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that those people would feel great kudos from having their work published in our platforms. You know, after all our newspapers and newspapers they've all grown up with. Um, so seeing your photograph in the Eastern Daily Press or the Hammond High or wherever it may be, that's something that is going to be very important to people. So I think it's, it's quite possible that you could create a, a photographer's club of some sort a localized one where people meet and I know these things already exist. So maybe we partner with, with an existing one and we add what we can add, but that in itself is just one fragment of what I hope will be a, a very round experience that uh, anybody who uses a, an Archant local website will feel this would be a disaster. If this went out of business, this is obviously a good thing. And I want to, contribute to it. I always tell my guys, you know, it's a shame for us when a public library closes, the local library closes, people go out and they paint placards and they write letters and they protest and they harangue their councillors and their MP. But when a local newspaper closes, a lot of the time people just shrug and say, oh, that's a shame, but I suppose that's mm. life. And they don't see what's missing. Now we've got to be in people's lives to the point where somebody says, oh, such and such a title's closing, they say, over my dead body. I love that. You know, that's my yeah. life. And I, you know, I find it very interesting. Um, that I've got a friend on the New York Times who told me that the number one, when somebody phones up to sub cancel their subscription on the New York Times, the number one reason that they decide not to on the phone call is when it's explained to them that they will lose their uh, recipe inbox. The New York Times has a very healthy food community. And every time you see a recipe on the New York Times, you can put it into your New York Times recipe box. And if you're not a subscriber, you lose access to that. And this is the point where most people sit there and say, oh, no, I, I can't do without that. I love my New York Times recipes and food. And so they're not thinking about the amazing commentary on Biden versus Trump or climate change or all of these extraordinary huge issues, they're thinking about that recipe box when push comes to shove, about the value that it gives them. And I think you can create analogies for that recipe box across a lot of different media and, and ask yourself, what are the things that people will come to love and depend on you giving them? Uh, and it's likely, more likely than not, it's not going to be day-to-day -day news and sport. It's going to be something else. And I think finding the something else is going to be the secret to unlocking people's willingness to, to literally pay for what they're doing with you. Well, in, in Norfolk, you've launched um, Local Recall, I think it's called, a yeah. platform which gives access to over 150 years of local news. So there you are drawing on something that is unique to you, the archive yes. um, of, of the Eastern Daily Press, um, and, um, and then offering it back in a different format. Is, is that one of the things you're looking at? Yes, definitely. Uh, again, that was actually Lorna's project. Um, Local recall, brilliant concept that you can just ask Alexa or whatever audio platform you choose to tell you the news today, 10 years ago on your birthday, whatever, the last time Norwich won 3 0. You obviously have to go quite far back to get that one. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a new way of consuming content. And we know that audio is, is becoming more and more important in people's lives. So we've got local recall, we've got a site called the story of, which is another uh, unique project where we're trying to get people to um, post their own historic photographs to demonstrate the history of where they live or their school or their business uh, and to create nostalgic photo albums. So anybody can go in and say, you know, let me see all of the photos from Norwich Market Square between 1939 and 1945, and they'll all be there. So in a way it's doing for geography, what Ancestry.com does for people. So I think that's another interesting way of getting people involved. Um, you know, there's so many ways uh, to, to engage people, but I think the trick is rather than thinking there's a silver bullet, it's recognizing that you've got to do it person by person, community by community. You've got to, and you've got to do it really well. There's no point saying, oh, there's loads of book groups in Norfolk, so let's do a book group site or let's have a book group channel 
you've got to make it indispensable to people in some way. So it's not easy. There's, I think that's a mistake people have made in the past where certainly it was a mistake I made at the Mirror when I, I launched, a um, again, a similar site based around the Mirror's extraordinary archive of football photography. We launched a site called Mirror Football. And if you were a fan, you could go in and search for the first match you ever saw or the first goal you remember, or whatever it might be. Extraordinary resource. But of course, nobody did because it was all just too much of an effort. So you mm-hmm. have to you have to um, do a lot of the legwork for people to, to suck them in and to make them realize that this actually this is a great way to spend time, because ultimately that is the fight we are in. It's not really for people's eyeballs or their you know the, the, which news channels they consume we are in a fight for people's attention and that if, if we can get their attention we are relevant to them and if we can't then we are irrelevant and our business model has always been about relevance so i think uh, yeah, again we've got to on a case-by-case basis look for what is it that people are really caring about and how can we add value well, Peterborough Matters was the first project Neon site to launch. What what have you learnt from that that you might be able to take to your other regional papers? Don't launch a site during a, a viral pandemic. Is the, <laughs> is, <laughs> is the first one. Actually, that's it's really unfair because commercially it's true that it's been it's been a very uphill start for the commercial um, uh, employee who started on Peterborough Matters because she hasn't been able to go and visit people, you know, and see shopkeepers and so on and so forth. Hopefully that will start changing uh, uh, as, as we, as we go on into the, into the winter. But what I have learned is that employing people from the community, uh, people who love the community, who have lots of contacts within the community, what a head start that gives you, you know, we've got four journalists working on Peterborough. Uh, Peterborough Matters. Peterborough has got about 200,000 people. Um, it's a very vibrant city. It's very fast growing. And it's got a, you know, it used to have a daily newspaper. It's now got a weekly newspaper owned by Johnston Press. And we felt there was room for more content. And we looked for people and we found a terrific chief reporter who was an ex journalist, but had gone into marketing and was running the marketing for the council, knows everybody. Uh, John helped us recruit three other people who um, were locals, a couple who'd worked in London, wanted to come back, um, a, a lady who'd come in from India uh, for three or four years ago, radio journalist, wanted to get really stuck in, loved Peterborough, really made herself at home there. And and so having people who who just love where they work is, I think, an undervalued uh, asset when you start putting up job descriptions. And one of the um, changes I've seen over my career is how, as I, you know, as I bored on to you about my start in life in the Formby Times, you know, where I lived and how much of a pleasure it was to work there. These days, people tend to go to university, then a journalism course, and then they're sort of parachuted into a community or a newspaper that they may never have had any dealings with, didn't even know existed until they saw the, the job advert. And and that's one route in, and it's produced some fantastic talent. But we mustn't be blind to thinking a little bit more broadly about the people who are out there who are, have perhaps once been journalists or, or have share some of the great skills of journalism who would love to get involved uh, and live there and, 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 and just want the community to be, to be better. And that, I think, is the the central learning so far from from Neon is if you get those people in, it's not a chore to them. They are at home and they love what they're doing. And we have got almost half a million page views a month now from Peterborough Matters, which in terms of the trajectory it's meant to be on is, is, is magnificent. So very happy with the start we've made there. And we'll be announcing, I hope, very soon uh, two new um, launches for the Project Neon. Great. Um, and, and hopefully they won't be quite as adversely affected by uh, the not. global <laughs> pandemic this time. Do you think that sometimes the regional press suffers from a quality issue, particularly when it comes to its digital offering? 
Uh, I think it has done in the past. I, I Let me reframe it. I wouldn't say, and this probably will get people's backs up, so it'll make a good quote for your blurb. I think regional press has suffered from a self-esteem issue in the past where I don't think they've had the confidence to say our model, what we do is fundamentally different to what a national newspaper does. And so if our website looks a little bit like the Daily Telegraph's website, there's something very wrong. And I think 15 or 20 years ago, when these websites were being conceived and designed, I think the regional press looked and said, do you know what? We haven't got the money that the Telegraph or the BBC or the Times has got, you know, so let them do all the research and development and we'll copy what they do. And that's why fundamentally all of our local websites across the whole country look broadly the same, you know, news, sport, features, opinion, blah, 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 blah. You might see uh, births, marriages and deaths somewhere at the top as a sort of classified opportunity where you can go and read five or six paid for lines. But to me, that sums up the problem is that our, our navigation ought to read births, marriages and deaths first. You know, that's what's really important to a local community. Um, news is obviously always going to be important, but it's not the only event. And I think also our commercial offering would have differed. I think we would have paid a lot more attention, as we are doing now, to how can we help local businesses not fall into a trap of thinking that the internet is just the land of milk and honey, but actually presents some very real and present danger to what they've been doing for generations. And how can we support the local high street in a more meaningful way? So I think it's belated, but I think the time has come round now. And in, in, in some ways, this is what's so disappointing about the timing of coronavirus is that mm. we have been making such fantastic progress in this regard at Archant. Uh, yes, this is what uh, our capital have seen and bought into, but we were getting there at a rate of knots. And I hope we will continue to get there at a rate of knots. Our model is different and our thinking is different. Um, that's why Google uh, gave us millions of pounds to help us um, develop these this thinking. Because I, I really feel what we're doing is, is different in the marketplace and it's got a real chance of succeeding. There's a logic to what we're doing and it would be a great thing if it works because local communities will, will benefit in a real way. Um, so, um, yeah, I think... Uh, there's a quality issue generally across the whole of journalism. It's not, you know, when I was schlepping up and down the M6 for very little more than my B&B &B was costing me, it wasn't for the love of journalism entirely. It was because my first job on the Daily Mirror earned me £42,000 in 1996. And you could buy a house with that in London in 1996, or at least you could get a, a mortgage for one. And Nowadays, you know, why would anybody want to drive 200 miles to do a, you know, a, a night shift on a national newspaper and try and improve themselves and reach that bit further if the job at the other end doesn't exist anymore? So I think, you know, as journalism has declined in commercial value, it has been less exciting uh, and, and, and a less sort of glamorous option. But the flip side to that is that the people I see who are still passionate about being journalists are still uh, committed to it in a way that goes beyond its monetary value. Thank God, you know, none of us are in it for the money anymore. Um, they're in it because it's a great job. It's fun. You're working with very bright, intelligent people. You're at the heart of deciding important things, or you could be, should be. If you're not, then then what are you doing? You're at the heart of that conversation going on in a newsroom. And, and where else would you want to be except for in the middle of a newsroom when things are, things are happening? Uh, so I think people are still probably overall, the numbers are down and overall, maybe because of that, you, you, you get fewer newspaper superstars now. But I think generally speaking, the bedrock of talent coming through is as committed as it as it ever was, maybe even more so. On a different note, um, back in 2016, you launched The New European and you were the editor of that for three years. I don't think you 
even expected it to last that long when when you first launched it. I didn't can expect it to last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a bit more about that and, and what lessons you've learned from that? Yeah, um, well, it was opportunistic, and that's one lesson. It's um, you know, everybody focuses on the 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 graph, the lines on the graph that are going down, uh, and understandably so because they're very important. But equally, don't take your eye off the opportunity to do something interesting and exciting and, you know, even ultimately profitable as the new European has become. Um, so being agile and having a go without fear and without worrying too much what all the naysayers say about it, because there are always bitter people out there who think you're an idiot, they knew best, and if only they'd been in charge, nothing would have gone wrong. Well, they are bitter and foolish and do your best to ignore them. I'm not very good at ignoring them. Sometimes I bite back, but always just pretend they don't exist. Uh, so have a go. Don't be afraid, but look for an audience that really cares about something and be very clear about telling that audience that you are there for them. You know, it, it's not a local media or any media. It's not a time to be nuanced about who you're trying to appeal to. You know, you've got to make it very clear that. This is your newspaper. And that's what we had a go with, with the New European, when we said we're the paper for the 48%. And you've got to remember, we launched it nine days after the referendum. I had the idea the next day, I thought, my gosh, there's this new thing, this constituency that didn't even exist yesterday. But now it exists. It's got a name, the 48%. They're all angry about something. And there's no great media for them to, to, to show, to demonstrate that they are one of this, this cause. And I, you know, I've often said about the launch of The Independent when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, and they had that wonderful marketing slogan, The Independent, it is, are you? And of course, like the sheep I, I am, I, I decided to demonstrate my independence by buying The Independent and, and holding it under my arm, you know, as a school kid. And I thought, what would you, what would you hold under your arm if you were a Remainer uh, the day after the referendum? And the answer was nothing. You couldn't show show you that that support. So I thought, well, let's give them a newspaper. Archant was brilliantly quick and agile in saying yes. The chief executive at the time, Jeff Henry, uh, hats off to him. He he said, bring me a business case tomorrow, one page. And so we turned up the next day. And in truth. I was, I, I'd sort of been there six months and I was expecting Jeff to sort of pay lip service to the, to the new boy, you know, didn't want to upset me too, too early. Um, but we sat down with this one page business case and we said, do you know what, let's, let's, let's have a go, but we'll only do it for four weeks. So how bad can it be? And we'll call it pop-up publishing. And at, at that point, I, just, I saw the chief financial officer's shoulders relax and he sort of thought, well, you know, if it's only four weeks, how bad can it be? But we launched it. The first issue sold 40,000 copies at two pounds a copy. Um, and then it's, it's, it's continued to sell very well. We've now got, uh, now each week it sells close to 20,000 and we've got more than 10,000 subscribers every, who get the paper every week. Uh, and it's been hit a little bit by COVID, but we're seeing that come back immediately. And so my big concern about, you know, four years later, what is this new European, this paper for the 48%? What does it become when the 48% is no longer 48% of anything? And we are under the new editor, Jasper Copping, who, who was there from day one, so gets it absolutely in his bones about what the paper is meant to be. Um, we are migrating into a, a, a paper that is more for the radical centre, for the discussion and debate and ideas around what can Britain be in a in Europe going forward and mm. we've in the meantime we've uh, developed a very strong website as well under a chap called John O'Reed who works works his works his socks off to uh, to to produce content almost alone uh, with a couple of helpers and I can't emphasize just how small the staff is of the new European, we have our Christmas party in a phone box. It's time. Right. <laughs> and um, it's, uh, you know, Jono now gets around 3 million uh, page views a month on that. So it's, it's a very 
it's making a very good contribution to the business now, several hundred thousands of pounds a year, which is, as you can imagine, in these straitened times is very useful. Great. Well, that's a, a good news story. Now, yeah. you're a big advocate for reporters being out and about in the community, and you, you have touched on that a little bit. But when a vaccine has been found, hopefully, and COVID is a thing of the past, how do you see working practices changing? Do you think that journalists will be working from home as a norm in the future? What What do you think will happen? I th- well, I think um, the office debate is very interesting, isn't it? Because I think immediately people thought, crikey, this actually works. We can still get the paper out. We can still get the websites out. Productivity's actually gone up. People feel happier, or a lot of people do. Very interesting. And because I'm, you know, in middle age now and, and settled with kids, uh, not having to commute in and out of an office was a great thing for me. But uh, when I speak to some of our younger journalists, they really miss the newsroom experience, you know, and they miss being amongst colleagues and the camaraderie. And so I think it's it's a bit blasé to, to suggest, as I have done, I think, in the past, that it was, you know, just a, a wholly good thing. But nevertheless, I do think that journalism has become a bit of a desk job in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And it, it never was when I was growing up the office or the desk was the place you went to to write up your story and that was only because you couldn't really write it up anywhere else because you didn't have wi-fi or you didn't have a decent laptop or anything so and it was also to be fair to the office it was also the place where the community walked in with their births announcements or the the marriage photos or whatever so the office did play a very crucial role back then if you look at the office now beyond the ability to get people together and to, which is very important, you know, to have that spirit and sense of purpose amongst people. Doing the job, you can do it from anywhere, anywhere with a phone signal these days. You can take your own photographs or video. You have a, a laptop that's easy to carry. Uh, you can, we, we're investing a lot of money in a new CMS, a content management system that will enable our journalists to file copy from anywhere in the world, uh, wherever they are. Uh, so my answer to your question is, is I would love it if people left their desks and were out in the community talking to people, um, picking up stories. I've never been out on a job in my life that hasn't got better from being from meeting somebody who was involved in it. Never. So if you're a journalist, a local newspaper journalist particularly, and you find yourself sitting in an office or these days at your home and you're monitoring feeds of social media or doing the usual phone calls to the police, the ambulance or whatever, I, I would say that's, that's fine and it's got to be done, but get out as well. You know, take the time to get out and, and make yourself visible in the community because if people don't realise that we are there, then, then they, they, they will think we are detached as so many local papers have become. And I I do think that this idea of office closures uh, being the death knell of local newspapers is a a real misnomer. I mean, just to repeat what I said, you know, the offices were there for specific purposes that have all been superseded now. And I know for a fact that we've had offices where the journalists would lock the door and and be in the back room. So it it, it wasn't any use to the community. It was just a, a place to go and work. Now, I can only speak for myself, but I would sooner be sitting in a cafe with good Wi-Fi, having a cup of tea and writing up an interview I've just done and then moving on to the next story. I think my productivity would be better. My sense of what's going on in the community would definitely be better. And I'd feel part of that, that community, which has got to be, that's got to be at the heart of everything we do. Brilliant. And finally, outside of work, what do you do to relax? To relax? What's that? <laughs> um, there must be something. Well, <laughs> well, since I left Twitter, I, I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands. Um, so I, I like creative writing. I like reading poetry. Um, I like, there's a wonderful resource on YouTube called um, Yale Courses, where you get American Yale professors. Basically, all they've done is they've videoed their 
their courses and the huge range of courses. So I like sitting, listening to Yale professors talking about the work of W.B. Yeats versus Robert Thro Frost or, 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 or similar. And I, I, I've always been a Liverpool fan, so I like or did like watching Liverpool win the league last year. And I've got three kids, so um, I like keeping my wife as happy as I possibly can by being as involved in, in their lives as I possibly can. But there's a lot of, a lot of running around. We all lead such insanely busy lives these days that I can't help feeling at some point somebody very wise will suggest we all take a bit of a, a breather and try and just open up a little bit more thinking time because that, that's what strikes me as, as being missing. When you're in a panic in or you, you're worried and concerned about something and you decide the option is to work your way through it, sometimes you forget to think. And I always remember reading a biography of Steve Jobs where he said he would often, you know, every day he would go for long walks with either by himself or with, with his team. And it was during those walks that, that ideas came, really good ideas. And so getting out of the office, getting the fresh air into your brain and just having a different context, I think, gives you a different perspective on life and, and will help you relax in your work as well. Because this idea of work-life balance, I think, again, it's, it's a fallacy. I think if you truly want to be happy as a person, then you, what you've got to try and aim for is a, a, a situation where work and life are, are not opposed to each other but complement each other in a positive way um, that's why journalists I think are very lucky people because you can't say that about standing on a you know a factory uh, conveyor belt line you can't say it about plucking chickens in a slaughterhouse or whatever it might be but we get to walk around and reflect communities that we care about and hopefully to think about them as well and it's all good in that regard Matt Kelly, thank you very much for being our guest on the In Publishing podcast. You're welcome. Very, my pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for having me. A big thank you again to Acorn Web Offset for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for a new magazine printer, then check out their website at acornweb.co.uk or contact Matt Carey on 07714 299 105 or by email at matthew.carry at acornweb.co.uk. Thank you to Matt for being our guest this week. You can find out more about Archant on their website, archant.co.uk. If you'd like to know more about in publishing, then head to our website, inpublishing.co.uk or we can be contacted by email at editorial at inpublishing.co.uk. Thank you for listening, and please join me next week on the In Publishing Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>